Chip Jones. I'm the Director of Education and Training for Blaze Sports America. It is my pleasure to continue our webinar series this year with an exciting webinar, Pedaling for Paralympics, Development of Paralympic Cycling Program. Our speaker today is Greg, Craig Clifton, excuse, Craig Griffin, excuse me, Associate Director of High Performance Cycling for U.S. Paralympics. Craig is originally from New Zealand, and he serves as the head coach and high-performance director for training and competition for U.S. Paralympic cycling team. That group won 14 medals in the 2008 Paralympic Games. Prior to working with Paralympic cyclists, he served as the U.S. cycling head coach for current athletes for the 1992, 96, and 2000 Olympic Games. During that period, he led U.S. athletes to 48 Olympic Paramer Paramerican World Championship and World Cup medals. On behalf of Blaze Sports America and U.S. Paralympics, it is my pleasure to welcome Craig as our speaker today. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, cycling, specifically Paralympic cycling. Um, this is probably going to be the first of, of two or three webinars that we'll be doing over the course of uh, this year. So um, some of this may be information you know already. Uh, this may be a refresher. Uh, for others, it may be new information that you uh, have not seen yet, and, but hopefully uh, it's something that you'll get uh, to see and, and uh, at home and maybe even a little something. Um, so we're going to keep it pretty basic. Uh, there's probably a lot of questions that will go unanswered. Uh, feel free to answer those, uh, ask those questions uh, at the, the end of the, uh, the webinar or um, send them to Jeff and he'll pass them on to me. Um, so again, I want to thank you for joining and uh, hopefully um, everyone will be able to stay awake through this. Okay, today the objectives are um, to provide you a better understanding of the sport of Paralympic cycling. Um, hopefully it will enable you to develop local programming in your area for uh, athletes with disabilities uh, and give you some idea of how to teach the basic skills of, of cycling um, with an understanding of some solutions for the disabilities um, that you may encounter along the way. Paralympic cycling. Uh, I'm going to start with an organizational overview. I'm going to spend a little bit of time about uh, giving you some information about classification and divisions of uh, the athletes. This is important because before we get to get started and move forward, you have to understand what their abilities or disabilities are and what their limitations are. So um, this has a huge impact on, on selecting equipment or the right equipment for the athlete. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, venue selection, about how to choose the appropriate venue to, to run a program or to begin getting people on a, on a bike or a trike or a, or a hand cycle. Uh, and then talk briefly about some of the activities and proficiencies that are um, required or the athlete will need to acquire uh, along, the, along the way to, to becoming a, a cyclist. Just a little bit of history and an overview of Paralympic cycling. The IPC, the International Paralympic Committee, is, uh, is the governing body for, for Paralympic sport. Um, they basically create a lot of the, the rules, regulations, procedures, and are, are basically the keepers of, of the Paralympic flame. They work in conjunction with the IOC, the National uh, Olympic Committees, and the national governing bodies uh, and international governing bodies of, of each individual sport. The Paralympic uh, cycling is run, actually it used to be under the umbrella of the IPC. The IPC handed it off in 2006 to the UCI, and the UCI is the, the international governing body for cycling. Um, and they now uh, manage Paralympic cycling worldwide. So this happened in 2006, and with that, there, there, there come some growing pains. Um, 
and some, some development in the sport. But it's a good, it's a good transition. Um, they're handing off cycling to an organization that knows cycling very well, and it's becoming very standardized and integrated into, into the, the regular cycling community. Uh, the UCI mandated that as of January 1, 2009, uh, that each national governing body, and in this case it's USA Cycling, play a role with their Paralympic cycling programs. So USA Cycling uh, has a role with, with Paralympic cycling, but they're not quite ready to take on the full programming of Paralympic cycling in the U.S. So hence, the USOC and U.S. Paralympics uh, has undertaken the responsibility to run Paralympic cycling um, from its offices here in Colorado Springs until such time that the uh, the U USA Cycling has the strength and capacity to, to fully take on uh, Paralympic cycling as they do with mountain biking, as they do with BMX, road cycling, track cycling. So it is under the organizational umbrella of USA Cycling, um, but the programs are, are run and driven out of the USOC and with, uh, by US Paralympics, and that's the division that I work for. US Paralympics, it, it's with a pretty big hat. Um, we're often the NGB or the national, national governing body to many sports and the, the big three sports are cycling, swimming and track and field and we take an active role in, in running these programs and not just the national team programs but also the developmental side of things. Uh, working on community programming, um, athlete education, coaching education, officials education. So we, we don't just work with the elite athletes, but we reach down and, and try and work with the uh, community-based programs, um, which, is, which is basically the role of a national governing body. So, so we wear a pretty big hat um, in, this, in this field uh, because we're trying to do a lot of things from development to elite um, athlete preparation. So under U.S. Paralympics, we have U.S. Paralympics, uh, from an from a elite athlete or sports standpoint, we have the Paralympic Academy, which is uh, working with, with uh, hiring young, young athletes into the sport and giving them the, the Olympic and Paralympic opportunity and feel. We have the military programs, and we also have the sport clubs. So we, we have a very broad reach um, into our sporting programs, uh, which, is, which is quite unique from a lot of other athletic programs. From a Paralympic cycling uh, standpoint, we have uh, a performance pipeline. And as you can see, it's, there's different tiers to this. We have the, the recreational, development, emerging, talent pool, national team, and of course the Paralympic podium. What we're really focusing on right now is working at this, the bottom end of the pyramid uh, and trying to grow the base. As, as you all know, the, the bigger we can grow the base of the pyramid, the higher we will get. And this is a, a task or a challenge for all of you that we really need to grow the space over the next three or four years so we can have a huge pool of athletes to draw from and not just athletes but talented athletes. So every, every level, uh, a different group has a different role. And we're not asking the community level to work with the national team athletes, so, although hopefully a lot of the community level programs will come to the national team um, we're really trying to create a, uh, a purpose uh, and a goal for, for the different levels. And as you can see, you know, what we, what we want to do is, is get the sport clubs uh, and the community programs working at the recreational, developmental, and emerging level. And this is basically taking new athletes and giving them the skills, giving them the confidence, giving them the knowledge to be able to go into uh, a competition scenario or where they, where they start competing on a regular basis. So Paralympic cycling disciplines, um, we have uh, basically road and track racing. Uh, the road racing um, is two disciplines. We have the road race and the individual time trial. As you probably can guess, the road race is a mascot event. It involves wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. It involves tactics. It involves drafting. Distances are anywhere between 50, uh, 15 and 50 miles. Um, it really, 
depends on the, the disability group, depending on how far they go. The less uh, disabled the athletes, they usually go the longer distances. And in fact, the tandems will race above 50, they're probably more like 60 to 70 miles. But for the majority, 50 miles is, a, is, a, you know, is, is sort of the upper limit. For the more disabled categories, they're racing between uh, 10 and 15 miles. Uh, again, this would, would vary uh, depending on the course, the hillier the course, the shorter the distances, the flatter the course, the longer the distances. So uh, the terrain will have an effect on the, the, uh, the length of the event. Uh, individual time trial, it's basically a race against the clock. There's no drafting allowed. Individuals are usually set off at 30 second or one minute uh, intervals, and it's a race against the clock. Um, this is how we, we select and, and identify athletes through individual time trials. And so each uh, disability category has a specific performance standard based on an individual time trial. So as you get an athlete that is, is beginning, beginning to take a, an active role in cycling, they're beginning to train uh, or, or participate on a regular basis, they are, at some point want to race and they want to compete. Um, we use an individual time trial on both the road and the track uh, to evaluate uh, and measure performances. So uh, this, the individual time trial becomes sort of a, a standard or a yardstick that we use to gauge an athlete's performance. On the track, unfortunately, it's open just to, to bicycles and tandems. No trikes or hand cycles are on the track. And if you haven't seen a velodrome, it's a, it's a banked track. Uh, the bankings can vary from 20 degrees up to 45 degrees. The shorter the track, the steeper the bankings. The longer the track, the more shallow the banking. Most of the, uh, the standardized tracks are 250 meters for international competition. The, uh, most of the tracks in the U.S. are around 333 meters. Um, all the events that we compete in on the track are timed events. Uh, women compete in a 500 and uh, 3,000 meter time trial. The 3,000 is often called an individual pursuit. And the men compete in a one kilometer time trial, which is again more sprint oriented. And the 3,000 and 4,000 meter pursuits are more endurance oriented. Getting started. Basically, the first step, and I alluded to it before, is to determine the disability and the classification. We're not asking you to, to uh, have some sort of medical background, but, but to have a basic knowledge of what that disability is and what it uh, may lean to in, in terms of equipment selection is very important. Um, before we can get on a bike, you have to know what the athlete can or can't do. So to have an understanding of what their disability is will, will help you get them on the right equipment. It will give you an idea of what equipment might be available or not available. It will help you with selecting the right equipment and then fitting them to that equipment. Um, basically, once you get them on a bike and you get them fitted, you can actually start to do some regular programming and activities. And when I mean regular, we're talking about once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Um, it really depends on what type of program you want to run, but you don't want to rush out and try and do something every day. You, you've got to take a, a small step, get a group together, figure out how to run your, your programming, how to run your sessions, and then build upon those and, and uh, start to be more uh, task and goal oriented once you develop a better feel for how to run your sessions. And we'll get into that in a, in a little minute. Uh, and ultimately, we want to we want to integrate these uh, cyclists with disabilities into able-bodied activities. The whole goal is to have Paralympic cyclists or disabled cyclists be part of the cycling community. Um, it's a, cycling is a great sport. It's a lifelong sport. Um, we have Paralympians that are that are in their 50s still competing. We have people at at uh, Masters Nationals. Able body, of course, but Masters Nationals who are competing in their 70s and, and 80s. So it's a lifelong sport, and, and ultimately we want to keep these people in sport, and uh, from health, obvious health purposes, but also for community involvement, camaraderie, and uh, a sense of belonging. So it really is important that we we don't just have groups of cyclists competing with 
like individuals. So we want to integrate them into able-bodied activities and heighten their experience with cycling, ride with new people, challenge themselves, have greater experiences, and turn it into a lifelong activity. Uh, classification. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, there are multiple, and we'll go through these classes in a minute, there are multiple uh, classifications and categories. We have a group of international and national classifiers. Unfortunately, we only have uh, one or two in the U.S. Um, that basically evaluate each individual and put them into a designated category based on a series of tests and measures that they have. Um, basically, we're trying to put people into different categories and, and divisions with similar disabilities so we can create a level playing field. Uh, this becomes important, not necessarily from a participation standpoint, but once we start to, to engage in competition, uh, to have someone competing in the right category uh, becomes very important because there is a, a, uh, a lot of cloudiness and a lot of gray areas whether someone is eligible to compete against someone else um, based on their ability or disability. So um, it's very important to, at some point, once they begin competition, to understand what uh, their classification is or where they may classify. Um, no need to worry about that right now. Uh, it, the most important thing is to understand what their disability is or what their limitations are and how to adapt them to that bicycle, tricycle, hand cycle, or tandem and just get them participating. The next step is once they're participating, of course, uh, hopefully they'll compete. And once they start competing and trying to make some sort of performance standard, then we need to know their classification. And when that occurs, basically I get emails from athletes, phone calls, and I steer them to uh, our classifiers um, who can give more of a, uh, a detailed uh, analysis of, of where they may fit. Uh, we have competitions, national championships that are coming up in a few months, uh, actually end of June and, and also the end of July, where we don't ask people to have a classification status. We just let, if, you, if you're disabled, um, come compete, and we'll figure out at that event where you may classify and classify. So it's not, it, it shouldn't be a hurdle to get people on the bike. It should be a hurdle to get them competing. But at some point when they're trying to... Um, go to the next step in trying to develop a, a, a performance or have an idea of where they, how competitive they are, we need to know where their classification is. Uh, there's a link here. If you click on this link, it gives you more detail. Um, it's on the US Parallel website, specifically cycling. It gives you more detail uh, about the injuries and where someone might land as far as classification goes. So we talk about spinal cord injuries. Right now, there's three major categories. Um, and this is probably the hardest, the hardest uh, group to, to identify and, and get into a, into a bicycle or into cycling or into a hand, hand cycle. Um, as you see, there's ACA, which is the most severely disabled. Um, basically, they have a high level of disability. They don't have any and in very little torso strength. Um, they have thermoregulation limitations. They have grip limitations. Uh, the ACBs are, are not quite as affected, um, but they have limited trunk stability. HCCs are, are basically uh, lower limb function or lower limb loss, uh, and where conventional cycling is not viable. Uh, so all these, all these uh, groups fit into cycling, and uh, the, the trick is getting people into the right hand cycle. So we start off, this is your basic uh, hand cycle. Um, it's not very sophisticated, it only has a couple of gears. It has a coast to break, um, where, you, where you back pedal to break. It's rec recreational, it's for new, new athletes, um, for heavy set or overweight individuals. The beauty of this is it's easy to transfer. It's easy to operate. It has an excellent turning radius, uh, pretty adjustable. Um, however, it has some drawbacks with a high center of gravity. You're sitting high where um, 
it makes it very easy to transfer right from the chair to the cycle. But because of the high center of gravity, it makes it very top heavy and uh, very in, in state, uh, unstable at high speeds of above 12 mile an hour. It's also uh, not very stiff. It'll flex, uh, and uh, of course, this also leads to instability. But this is a great entry level uh, hand cycle. Again, very easy to use. Um, but at some point, if anyone wants to talk about participating, they're going to help grow this, this uh, machine pretty quickly. Uh, we have completely the other, the other spectrum, end of the spectrum. This is uh, in a recumbent, obviously, for the reason that an individual would lie, lie uh, back. Um, their legs are uh, attached and strapped to the, uh, the footrest here. Transfers are still pretty easy on this uh, type of machine because there are no, uh, no interferences to allow them to slide in from the side. So even though it's low to the ground uh, and stable, um, it's still relatively easy to transfer into. Uh, it's suitable for all levels of spinal cord injuries. Uh, it has one of the limitations is the turning radius is not quite as, um, as good as the upright, but again, it offers a lot more uh, sophistication. It's a lot lighter, um, a lot faster, and it has a lot more selection as far as gearing, um, where the upright has three to five gears, uh, these recumbents can have anywhere from 18 to 27 gears. The NELA, this is for uh, amputees and incomplete. Basically, they're not sitting anymore. They're knee kneeling. They're a little bit more difficult to, to transfer to. Um, however, their, the lower level disability um, allows the athletes, uh, I guess, a, a bit more um, maneuverability to get into it. Uh, abs are used along with the upper body. Um, it's a very powerful position, but if you're sitting upright uh, and you have a lot of frontal surface area, they're not quite as aerodynamic as someone sitting back in a recumbent. Uh, this is going to be a new category uh, for 2010. So we will see where I had showed you previously three categories for hand cycles, uh, we are now going to have four categories, and the NELA will be its own category. Right now, the, the NELA is competing with the recumbents, um, but they're going to split that category off. These bikes are uh, very fast. They're, they're a lot of fun to ride, but again, it's for a low-level disability, someone that has the use of their, amp, their, their abs, uh, and you need a fair amount of strength to ride them. So it's not a good bike for someone to start out with, but it's definitely uh, a bike worth investing into if someone's going to take up the sport and they meet those, um, those minimum physical requirements to, to be able to operate it. This is a bike that we don't see too often. It's a, it's a, a lean steerer. Basically, it can be for competitive or recreational. It requires the use of abs at times because as you lean over, uh, to steer, you have to be able to get yourself back up. And you will see on the side here, there are, there are uh, some handles on the side which you can put your weight on and push yourself back up. Um, it's similar to mono skiing, where you actually lean into turns. You can actually carve a turn. The learning curve is a little longer, a little bit more difficult to learn. Uh, but the enjoyment factor is, is huge. It's, they're really fun to ride. Uh, athletes get a real kick out of them. Uh, they have a great turning radius, but they're not the, the bike of choice for a lot of people now. They're, they're um, I would say they're more uh, recreational oriented than competitive these days. And again, everyone's going more for the recumbent um, and, uh, and the needle. So here's a quick overview. This was provided uh, by U.S. Hand Cycling Federation, but it just gives you a, a quick table um, to give you an idea of what bikes are best for uh, different disability groups. And so we've already talked about a little bit of this, um, but as you can see, um, it's pretty straightforward and, and uh, it's a good check for, for you all to, uh, to say, okay, um, this bike is a good, a good fit for this person. Uh, we have a, a youth model. Basically, they're just a, a, um, a, a scaled down version. They're about two thirds size of, of a, a recumbent uh, or an upright. Um, and we find that they're very good, the youth models, they're good for kids starting out. 
But if they're uh, you know, passionate about this at some point, they're going to outgrow them and uh, basically get into a full-size bike. Considerations when selecting the hand cycle, we've touched on this a little bit. Trunk, trunk strength and upper body strength will determine the bike. Again, if they're new to the sport, you start them out in an upright or a recumbent. Uh, if they have an abdominal function uh, or if they're a double amp, you want to get them into a, a recumbent or a kneeler. Um, then we talk about getting the body position and the spine angle, line of sight. Um, Grip strength. A lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the ACAs, uh, the high high level injuries have a loss of grip strength. Uh, there is some some uh, strapping you can do and some anatomical grips that that can be purchased uh, to put onto a, a hand cycle allows them to get a little bit more grip strength. Um, you've got to think about the ground clearance, the type of terrain that you're going to use the bike on. We're talking about wheel camber. If you look at these photos here. You can see upright versus recumbent. You can see ground clearance, how this is very low. It's aerodynamic, but it limits you. You can't, you can't do a lot of curb hopping. You can't go over speed bumps without bottoming out and uh, ending up being a teeter-totter, um, which can be frustrating at times. Um, the sight, you lay back too far in a recumbent and you lose your vision. Um, sitting up too high and you lose some aerodynamics and lose some speed. This is a good example just comparing the two different different types here. I believe this gentleman is an annealer. Um, and then we look at the wheel camber. We look at these wheels are cambered in, these wheels are perpendicular. The wheel camber does provide more stability and uh, it helps the cornering speed and, and uh, helps provide just a better ride. Safety flag is always encouraged. Um, a lot of my athletes don't use it. Um, I, I dis I'm disappointed when they don't because their safety is, is, is important. Uh, I would encourage if you have hand cycles in your program or you're purchasing hand cycles, make sure that you get a safety flag for it because these athletes are so low to the ground that often the uh, motorists do not see. They're looking f further ahead uh, and they just don't see something this low to the ground and so that's very important. The link at the bottom is to a uh, to a, a bike shop in in, uh, in Chicago in the Chicago area. It uh, has a great it's a great resource for adaptive equipment, not just for hand cycles, but also uh, for bicycles. They've been around a while, but they do a great job of of um, providing in, insightful uh, solutions to people with disabilities and fitting them to bike. So. If you need a resource about equipment, um, this link is very good. Um, there's also a great gentleman there, Hal Heinemann, who uh, is a fantastic guy, and he's very, uh, very receptive to answering questions and, and offering up his information and expertise uh, as far as adaptive solutions and equipment. So I encourage you to check out this link uh, and just sort of peruse some of their options when we talk about uh, adaptive solutions. Our next group, uh, we have a, a locomotive disability, and this is LC1. Um, essentially for athletes uh, with an, an, uh, an upper or a minor lower limb disability, uh, you can read through this description here. Some paralysis, um, amputation of a forefoot so they don't have their, their full foot, decreased muscle strength, leg length difference. Um, the most common type of athlete is, is the the upper extremity amputation, and as you can see, the gentleman, the German gentleman on the uh, on the right here, is missing an arm. And basically, athletes can ride with one or two arms. If they if they're, they're missing off their arm or they're missing their hand, they're still eligible. They just can't operate the bicycle with that affected uh, limb. So when I talk about operating a bicycle, they can't grip, uh, they can't brake, they can't change the gears with that affected limb. So we have to come up with some, some solutions, and uh, it's always great to see what sort of solutions are out there. Um, and basically what we see is, is people coming up with, with uh, adaptive equipment for brakes, shifting, and, uh, and prosthetic attachments to the bicycle. And the, the, the best things to do are, are to look at a thing called a brake splitter, and basically it takes 
the, the two brakes and joins them to one lever. And it's this little device uh, right here on the on the front of the bike and the, the picture on the left hand side. And basically it just works the two brakes off one lever. Uh, and it allows someone just with one hand to apply pressure to both front and rear brake. Um, we'll see also uh, a shifter, the shifter here on the on the uh, the end of the hammer, called a bar end shifter, and it allows someone to shift gears um, with one hand. And we look here at an attachment uh, with a girl who had made a carbon fiber handlebar, and all her operation is done off the left hand side of the bike, uh, and she's only using. The, uh, the right hand side of the bike or the right hand part of the portion of the handlebar for, for stability and to hold her in place. When, basically when we're setting someone up on a bike, um, we want to find that adaptive solution that, that fits to them. And because they're, they're, we don't want too much weight on the, on the prosthetic or, or on the front end of the bike, we want to set them up a little bit higher and we want to try and get them sitting back a little bit further in the saddle. Uh, and as they get to become more competent, they can get to a more aggressive position. Uh, here's some prosthetic choices. There's a lot of different choices out there. Um, what we will see is someone starting out with, uh, with a, a pretty generic prosthetic. And the photo here on the left is a gentleman that came to a camp. And he had a, basically a road bike set up with a mountain bike handlebar, so it's sort of like a T. Um, and then about two years later, this is him in the middle here at the velodrome with a completely different setup where he now started very upright, but he's worked his way down onto the drops of the handlebars. But it took him two years to do that. So the point of the, this slide is to tell you that there are many different options. You've got to start moderately conservative, and then as the athlete becomes more um, competent, they have more confidence in what they're doing you can put them into a more aggressive position. LC2, um, this is a, an athlete with a, a uh, lower limb disability below the knee. Uh, it also can be decreased muscle strength or leg length difference more than 12 centimeters, uh, restricted knee flexion. Um, they can pedal with or without prosthetics. Um, and it becomes uh, basically a choice of which prosthetic they use. We have a flex foot versus a post. A post is more of a straight attachment to the bike. Uh, the flex foot, what we see here on the, on the right-hand side, is usually common for triathletes. Uh, a lot of people that are, are getting off bikes and, and having to run uh, because it assimilates a similar feel. Um, but really, it doesn't matter. There's been a lot of biomechanical studies that have, have shown that there's not much difference between a post and a flex foot. It becomes a matter of preference. The most important thing, however, is how that, that prosthetic is attached. And uh, there's a, some different methods to attach. A lot of them involve a liner. The liners are important um, not only for the comfort and the fit of the prosthetic, but also to wick away sweat and at the same time to provide some, some suction and some, some attachment to the, uh, to the affected limb. And uh, there, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, trial and error with, with liners and, and getting the cup to fit right. But in the long run, uh, athletes usually find, find a fit that's good for them. And the liner and, and the, the cup are more important than the style of the the, uh, the post of the flex foot. If the fit's good, if the comfort's good, then the, that's the most important thing because if there's chafing, um, if there's any slop or, or slack in the, in the fit to the affected limb, that has more of a detriment on performance than the actual choice of, of, the, uh, of the post of the flex foot. Um, when starting out, a lot of the athletes that you will, will encounter will probably have more of a recreational uh, prosthetic um, they won't have one specifically adapted to a, to a sport. So this is where it becomes important how to engage them and, and attach them on the bike. Most bikes that you'll get them on will have basically a flat pedal. Um, 
the best thing to start with is just a clip and a strap. And uh, a toe clip and strap is pretty common. They're pretty cheap to get. I don't recommend you start off with a clipless pedal because that means uh, you've got to have an investment in a cycling shoe with a cleat that is attached to the cycling shoe. And that's sort of one step further than where a lot of your individuals may be. So um, the idea is to start with clips and straps, a regular walking prosthetic and foot with a regular shoe, and putting their foot into the clip, pulling up the strap, and sending them on their way. The idea is to have that foot attached to the pedal. If the foot is not attached to the pedal, then there is the chance that the, the foot will slip off the pedal, and now you've got a limb that is floating around uh, and will be a hazard to the pedal coming around or a hazard to the athlete balance. So it's real important to have that foot attached. So I encourage you to, to work on, on getting clips and straps onto any of the bikes that, that you propose on using. Uh, if you can't do that, you know, I've always used a bit of duct tape to, to get that foot attached in place and just make sure that they have the, the ability to, to be held um, and to be caught after they take, take the bike for a spin for the first time. Rider position, there's very, very few special needs. Um, the most important thing is just getting that limb, that foot attached to the bike, and they should be off and running in a pretty, uh, pretty short period of time. LC3, lower limb, uh, lower, lower limb disability, um, with or without an, uh, an upper disability, they general, generally pedal with one leg, so they're above the knee amputee. They can use a prosthetic or they cannot use a prosthetic. Um, we find that about two-thirds of our athletes choose not to use a prosthetic. Um, if you use one, then you have to have a very, very short crank so you cannot get any drive from that affected leg. Um, so uh, the only alter, I guess the only, the, uh, the other scenario of this is the double BK where you can ride with both prosthetics. This is where the adaptive solutions become a little bit more complex. Um, you can see that, that these are two photos on the right here are from athletes that have been in our program that pedal with one leg and they have made these carbon fiber stump cups that are molded to their stump and the stump is basically supported uh, while they ride. Um, with very high amputation, you would not need a stump cup. With a, with a, uh, a lower amputation, you would want to have that stump supported, not only to keep it flopping around and from flopping around in the breeze, but, but also uh, if you can support that stump, you now can, can stand up and put some weight uh, into pedaling the bike. And, and what I mean is you can you can come up out of the saddle, you can support yourself on that stump and the stump cup and use your body weight, some of your body weight, to drive the bike forward. Uh, here is a German gentleman. Uh, this, this gentleman is actually an LC4, but it gives you a, a look at, he's using a prosthetic, but he's using a very, very short crank here. Uh, and then that's the, the rules right now. It's a, a six centimeter crank. Um, you've got to use when you get someone with pedaling the bike with one leg or pedaling with one leg and a prosthetic with a short crank, um, you have to use straps or clipless pedals. There's no way to get that crank back up from the 6 o'clock to the 12 o'clock position if that you have no way of pulling that crank to the top. So there's no way to drive the bike forward if you cannot lift that that pedal up from the 6 o'clock position to the 12 o'clock position uh, on, the, on the back of the stroke. Most athletes have no problem pushing down from, from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, uh, but getting the pedal back up from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock is a challenge if you have no uh, ability to lift that pedal up. Uh, and of course, there's no leg on the other side or no pedal on the other side to push it down. So uh, that becomes a challenge. Rider position will really depend on, on the prosthetic setup and on the, the stump cup, uh, whether they're riding with one leg, two legs, or have any other disabilities going on. LC4, this gets complicated. Uh, as you can see, it could be a double amputation with prosthetics. It could be a single AK plus an amputation of an upper limb, as we saw in the photo uh, just previously, um, or significant decreases in muscle strength in both lower limbs. 
Um, there's a lot of adaptive solutions for these uh, individuals, um, from custom orthotics and braces to help support the, the lower limbs. Um, you would use, if there's upper limb af uh, af affected, you'll use an LC1 breaking and shifting solutions. You'll use an LC2 prosthetic solution for a BK. Um, for an LC3 um, or above the knee amputation, you use an LC3 stump cup. So in an LC4, you could be using all these adaptive solutions that we've talked about to, to get someone on a bicycle and, and, uh, and functioning. Here are some prosthetic resources, uh, some links to, uh, to organizations that, or, or individuals that have, uh, have helped some of our athletes um, develop uh, their prosthetics. And a lot of them are custom. Sometimes you just kind of get something off the shelf that's going to do the job uh, correctly. It might be something off the shelf might be a good starting point, but as they get more into cycling, they're going to find better solutions to riding their bicycle and to, to propelling it and to operating it. And this is where um, you start to look around at what some of the athletes are using and, and find groups that have uh, some sort of knowledge on how to adapt their existing prosthetics to, uh, to the bicycle and make it better. The next group, we have cerebral palsy and traumatic brain injury. Um, they are most most severely disabled group of the CP1s and CP2s, and these individuals ride tricycles. Um, they have locomotive dysfunction at least three extremities, very poor balance and coordination. So basically, they can't ride a bicycle. Um, they just don't have the balance and coordination to do it. They have a lot of spasticity, uh, and they also have thermoregulation uh, difficulties. So these indiv individuals are suited to tricycles. Um, there's, there's not that many trikes around. They're, they're hard to come by, and uh, there's not many resources and not a lot of, not a lot of high demand for, for tricycles. But when, when, uh, when getting someone on a trike, they have a lot of dis difficulties in mounting and dismounting a trike because of their, their instability. Uh, and so if, if you do have a trike or you are purchasing a trike, make sure that it has a parking brake. A lot of times I've, I've seen some of... Some of these, these individuals trying to get on bikes, and it's, it's, they're trying to get on something that's rolling away from them, and, it, and it's hard enough to, to get their leg over a, bike, uh, over a tricycle, let alone a moving target. So um, it's real important to have some way to lock the wheels to stop it from rolling away. Uh, or if this is not an option, you know, put some stops or stoppers beneath the wheels to stop them from, from rolling away or put it against the curb and, and make sure that it's, it's uh, in a safe position. Um, some of the, the adaptations are for the braking and shifting because of the, the spasticity and grip limitations are, are similar to an LC1. We would have brake splitters. Uh, steering dampers, these are like a little fluid filled piston that is attached to the fork, the front fork here, and also attached to this down tube. And basically what it does is just, if someone shakes a lot or they have a lot of twitchiness, um, a lot of, lot of upper extremity uh, spasticity, it ba takes all the vibration and the movement out of the front of the bike. So it will steer very, very slowly, uh, but it will be relatively stable. Another thing is the dual drive. And this is important because uh, sometimes the roads are cambered, and um, often a, the wheel will lift off the ground, and they end up spinning a wheel and getting, and getting nowhere, basically. So. Um, at some point when you're looking at, at purchasing a trike for someone or recommending a tricycle, you want to see if you can get one with a dual drive um, just because in the long run it's going to make it a lot easier for them uh, out on the road. We have CP3. Uh, these people may start off on a trike but have the ability to ride a bicycle. Um, they're, they're difficult because they're they do have a lot of balance difficulties. They have a lot of difficulty getting on and off the bike. They have grasp and release uh, coordination of hands. Uh, that, that's difficult. They have spasticity. Um, they have a little bit of paralysis. Uh, they also may walk with a limp. So again, we're talking about um, characteristics that are found in a lot of other uh, groups with disabilities. But again, the adaptive solutions are, are similar. This gal here. We have her bike set up with a little lever 
right here on the handlebar where she likes to ride on what we call the tops, the tops of the bar. You can ride on the, the brake hoods or you can ride on the very, very top so her hands would sit right next to her heart rate monitor. She can't grasp and release very well, so we put this little brake here, used a splitter as well, that allows her to operate the brake from, from a regular position or operate it from the top of the handlebar. So it just, again, makes, with, makes a, the function, functionality of the bike just a little more easier. CP4, these are the most uh, minimally disabled of the CP group. Uh, so in some of these folks, they just have a slight atrophy, a slight limp. Um, they're, they're usually afflicted just on one side. Uh, so basically, you come back to some adaptive solutions. And with this gentleman here, uh, he does everything just up one side of the bike. So normally, his brake levers would be one on each, uh, each side of the handlebar. He's got them both mounted um, on one side, and he operates his bike from one side, and it works very well for him. Uh, and generally, these, that's about the only ad adaptive measure um, you, would have to, you would have to do. Uh, and some of these folks, you don't even have to change it. They just have difficulty using the brake or grasping the bar, but it's not enough to change the brake lever or the shifting lever to the other side of the handlebar. The visually impaired. Um, there's three classes or categories. Uh, less than 60-60 vision uh, or a visual field of less than 20 degrees or no light perception at all. Uh, the big thing here is there's no distinction made when competing. So whether you've got partial sight um, or no sight at all, everyone competes together. Um, of course, they ride a tandem. Uh, as you can see here is a picture of a tandem. And I like this bike for a couple of reasons, and I'm not telling you to go out and buy a commotion. I'm just, oh, excuse me. I'm just uh, giving you an idea of maybe some choices when you're thinking about purchasing a tandem, putting someone on a bike, uh, or trying to fit them to a bike. You'll notice that there is a, a great, the great ability for uh, adjustability on this bike. You'll look at the, uh, the rear of the bike is very small but it has a telescopic seat post, so you can raise the saddle all the way up, or you can drop it all the way down. And this type of bike will, will, you know, will fit a 10-year-old, and it'll fit a 6'4", you know, individual. So um, it's, it's a great choice. Again, the, the stem and panel bar for, for the stoker, we like to call the, the, the blind person on the back, or the visually impaired person on the back, the stoker, the person on the front, the pilot. Um, again, the handlebar for the stoker is, is telescopic, which gives you a great ability to stretch, stretch someone out or bring the handlebars towards them. Um, and so that cockpit area the, between the, the handlebars and the seat is very adjustable. And that's what you want to look at for a bike that might be used in a program uh, in multiple people. Uh, we, we want to look at tires and wheels are probably the biggest uh, and tires, wheels, and brakes are probably the biggest uh, need for tandem, and it, it, that comes back to safety. Um, what we find is that, that if the wheels are not in good condition, if the tires are not in good condition, you're going to have a lot of mechanical difficulties. You're going to have blowouts, wheels that don't stay true, um, and if you have any of these problems out on, on a ride, it affects the handling of the bike, it, it, there's a high rate of, of, or a high chance that you could, you could crash, and crashing on a tandem is, is hard. There's no light crash on a tandem, even just toppling over, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard. So um, you've got to make sure that you have very solid equipment, light is not better. You want to have disc brakes, and, and we're trying to have disc brakes, because on a regular bike, the braking surface is down on the rim. When you're going down any descents, what happens is the a lot of heat that gets generated into the rim from the braking, it expands the air in the tire and you end up blowing a tire off a rim. So if you're in, an, in a terrain where, uh, in terrain with a lot of descending, a lot of cornering, a lot of braking required, you want to think about uh, having a tandem with this so you avoid the overheating of the tires, overheating of the rims, and having possible blowouts. Um, pilots or guides, um, 
their role is not necessarily to go fast. Their role is to provide a safe environment on and off the bike. I've seen individuals that, that want to pilot, but they don't look after the, the stoker. They don't look after the individually uh, uh, the individual on the on the back of the bike. They need to be a teacher. They need to teach them how to use the gears, how to how to pedal well. They need to teach them how to uh, temper their efforts on the bike. Um, they need to be their advocate also. They need to be out there uh, providing uh, guidance and feedback off the bike, making sure that that their needs are taken care of when when they're stepping off the bike and, and um, needing water, needing something to eat, a uh, place to sit, taking them to the bathroom. Uh, like I said, a lot of people that want to ride the bike, but they're not interested in, in helping the athlete off the bike. And, and there's a lot of preparation that goes into, you know, getting on shoes, getting a helmet on, getting a sit right uh, before you even step onto the bike. And a lot of these needs are not um, are not taken care of very well with with pilots. So when you're talking about finding a, a pilot or a guide, no, don't look just at the physical sense of what they can do on the bike, but also how well they can look after that person off the bike. Compatibility becomes uh, an issue. We can't have uh, you know a five foot, uh, ninety five pound petite female piloting for a six foot five individual. Uh, yes, it can be done, and I'm sure it has been done, but sometimes strength is needed to steer the bike, uh, to provide a stable platform when, when stepping onto the bike. Um, just for a fit, uh, sometimes you won't find a bicycle that has that, uh, the ability to, to, uh, to cover that difference in size. So you want to try and find people that, that have a similar size. Um, you want to make sure that that the person is skilled enough with cycling, and, and I don't like to put parameters on on who pilots can be or can't be, but you want to have them at least engaged in cycling and riding at some level or, or competing at some level. No, they don't have to be an ex-professional, having ridden the Tour de France, but they shouldn't be someone that just rides, uh, you know, once in the blue moon that says, yeah, I'll give it a go. They need to have having a, some sort of experience, preferably riding at, at a, a Cat 4 or Cat 3 level uh, in cycling. So they can not only maneuver the bike in a safe fashion, but they can al also have some educational component to it that they can uh, you know, deliver more than just the basics of riding a bike. There also has to be good uh, personality and communication. A lot of times there is uh, there's good there's good physical um, complements of the right size. They pedal the same. They have a good pedaling style. They match up well, well, but there's no there's no communication. There's no um, you know talking and, and feedback that goes on. And that's real important to to develop that relationship and and to have that connection with with the person that's on the front or on the back because at some point they are a team and. Uh, and it becomes important to to have that compatibility. Otherwise, it's going to be very much short term. Skill level and eligibility. Right now, I, I don't think that really matters. At some point, females when they start racing, females need to race with females as far as a pilot and stoker, and males need to ride with males. Um, the only eligibility at the international level is that you can't have been a professional cyclist for three years preceding that event. So um, that's not nothing really to worry about. Um, just some tips here when, uh, when mounting uh, a bike or a tandem. The pilot gets on first, holds both brakes, but straddles the top tubes with the, with, uh, the legs further apart uh, than the pedals. Um, what you want to do is provide a stable platform um, to allow the, the stoker to, to get onto the bike. The stoker will climb on the bike and clip in um, while the pilot is is holding the bike perpendicular to the ground and hopefully steady. Uh, once the, the stoker is clipped in, the, the pilot will ask the stoker to put the, uh, the pedals in the desired position. And then when, the, when, the, uh, when everyone's ready, the pilot will say, OK, we're ready to go. And off they go. 
with a brief pause to let the pilot to get uh, allow the pilot to get clipped in. So it's pretty straightforward, but often it's uh, it becomes a a uh, a communication issue and people are fiddling around and what foot, what pedal, how do you want me to do this? If it's understood right from the start, it makes getting on and off the bike a lot easier and, uh, and better choreographed. When we're talking about running in advance uh, or, or getting to the point where you're going to uh, run activities, you have to choose a couple of, make a couple of choices and, and the most important thing to do is location of, uh, of the venue that you want to use and what you want to do. A closed loop is by far the best and, and, and preferred. It could be a city park, it could be a bike path, it could be a large parking lot of an industrial area. Um, the reason we want a closed loop is for safety, but also uh, if you just want if to, you, if, you, if you have a point-to-point, -point, you start to lose control of your group because at some point the disabilities um, will and the, and the athletes and the, or the abilities will will disperse the group, and you'll have everyone spread over a, a three or four mile stretch, and you won't be able to give anyone any feedback. To have so to have a closed loop in a, in a park or on a bike path, a bike path or in a parking lot, is probably the best place to start. Parking lot, you probably need, um, I would say, five five hundred meters. You could, could, in fact, if you're allowed to, to get on a, a local running track, you could start there as well. Basically, you want a safe environment where you have full uh, view of your participants and can provide feedback. We don't want people riding off and them having difficulties and not have you not being able to do anything about it or, or know what's going on. Um, we want to have bathrooms, and we want to make sure that everything is accessible from a parking lot um, to the bathrooms. Uh, and anything else that, that, that may be required. The road width, the min, min, minimum road width is 18 feet, and I say that just because if you're doing any turnarounds, if you're doing any, any uh, turns, that's about what you need to turn a hand cycle or a tandem. Um, so think about that when, you talk, when you're talking road width. Um, a bike lane or a shoulder is important. You don't want to be in traffic. As you see, this is a city park. If you look at this, there is a bike lane there. Sometimes the bike lane may be, may be too busy or congested. You want to at least have a three to four foot shoulder that, that will allow a hand cycle, a trike, a tandem, um, basically the room to maneuver and, and not feel like they're getting squeezed by the cars. You want to try and have a road that doesn't have a lot of canvas so it's not rounded. Um, it can be uh, a little bit hazardous, like I mentioned, to the trikes that will unweight the wheel and, and, and cause them to, to uh, spin their wheel. Uh, with hand cycles, you'll find that they're at, if the road's canvas, they'll actually be leaning um, into the road, and basically it puts extra stress on their arms and on their shoulders, um, lower back, and it basically create asymmetry in the in the pedaling motion and at some point can lead to injury. So you want to try and get, get the road as flat as possible. When starting out, you want to have the profile or the, the terrain as flat as possible. Uh, the worst thing you can do is put in a lot of hills there and again have your group split up. Um, but at some point you want to go to uh, a, uh, a road that, or a course that does have some profile because you've got to teach them how to shift shift gears and how to ride the hills uh, and also to work on downhills and cornering. Uh, surface of the road, obviously you want to have a, a good road surface. You don't want to have potholes. You don't want to have rocks and, and strewn with debris and that's why city parks are good. Bike paths tend to have a lot of, to, tend to have a lot of, uh, of debris on them um, unless they're well kept in the city parks. Uh, but you want to try and have a hard surface. The thing that you don't want to do is be dealing with flat tires and, and broken equipment. Um, when you run an activity, you've got to have a plan and a goal, um, whether it's for beginners or whether it's for people that you're, you're, um, you're trying to have a continuing uh, education and, and uh, progression with. There needs to be instruction, there needs to be evaluation, there needs to be feedback, and there needs to be progression. That's just any, those are just the basic keys for any program. So it becomes important that you, you have a plan, you write it down, you have a clipboard or something, you communicate that with your participants 
uh, and any of the volunteers or, or people that are helping you. You want to make sure that your equipment is in good working order. So many times we've turned up to these to run activities and the equipment, you know, you're, a lot of times you're using borrowed equipment um, or loaned equipment. Uh, the equipment isn't checked out, it's just handed over a lot of times and, and it's as in the, the state that it was left in the last activity. Uh, so you've got to get the equipment early, you've got to check it, you've got to run over with a wrench, you've got to pump tires, um, you've got to make sure that it's in good working order. The, the, the worst thing uh, that can happen is you've got equipment that is not adjusted properly and um, it's not working and you have all sorts of frustrated participants. And remember, a lot of these people are going to be first timers and you want to, you don't get, the old saying, you don't get a, a second chance to make a first impression. So you've got to be organized and you've got to have this equipment sorted out early. If it means taking uh, equipment to a bike shop and getting it checked out uh, and, and tuned first or bringing um, a, a mechanic uh, from a local bike shop to the venue to check it out, or to the storage facility where it's getting uh, where it's getting stored. You need to do that because, uh, as I put on the bottom, time will be your enemy. Uh, if you plan uh, two hours for a session, by the time you get everyone there, by the time you figure out who you've got, by the time you fit them into a a bike and get those adjustments done, by the time you put on a helmet and communicate your plan to them. You know, there's an hour gone right there. Um, so you have to be very, very well organized. Uh, and I, I, uh, if you're running programs, the, the best thing that you can do is to form a relationship with a local bike shop, not only to to get equipment, but also to maintain your equipment, um, to provide some sort of maintenance program, uh, and uh, maybe to have someone there that can help volunteer their time. Uh, to, to troubleshoot and to set the bikes up because you, people just don't jump on a bike. A lot of these things, the hand cycles, the tandems, the bicycles, all need some sort of adjustment. So it becomes really important to, to have the tools necessary to, uh, to make those adjustments quickly and not just one wrench but multiple wrenches so multiple people can take on this task because it may take 10 or 15 minutes just to fit one person to a hand cycle. If you've got four people and there's only one of you, you, you've lost an hour right there. So it becomes real important to, to address that. Okay, we're nearly done here. Um, here's a list of activities. Safety is the most important thing, riding etiquette, etiquette equipment selection, uh, the bike, the clothing is important. You don't want people turning up in jeans and a t-shirt. They're going to overheat. Um, helmet, make sure the helmet's fitting well. Bike fit, uh, that's going to be a topic, uh, hopefully, of, a, of the next uh, webinar that we do. Um, bicycle operation and mounting, um, braking, cornering, shifting gears, uh, all become important. And my next slide, I think, uh, has a great link to a resource which we'll, uh, we'll go through in just a minute. Indoor sessions become very valuable. This is for what I would call uh, on a stationary trainer. They're good for bike fit and equipment familiarization. They're good for training, and they're good for people that have balance issues. So um, if you can find a bike shop that will loan you a stationary trainer or you have the ability to purchase one, um, I, I think that they're a great, uh, a great uh, piece of equipment to have because you can do bike fits, you can train, um, you can teach people how to use uh, equipment uh, and, and get some confidence before putting them out uh, onto the open road. Uh, also, tandems play a good role. People with balance issues or people learning how to ride a bike for the first time or don't have the confidence to get on a single bike, you can put them on the back of a tandem for a, for a certain amount of time or, or on a frequent or infrequent basis and give them the feel of riding the bike and build their confidence. Um, and then you, know, you can either put them into a hand cycle um, if they happen to be an amp or uh, you can put them onto a tricycle uh, or actually onto a bicycle. So it becomes very important. Um, evaluation and competencies. The goal of any, any uh, activity should be able to operate a bike safely, uh, execute control by braking and cornering, stop and go without assistance, ride in the correct place on the road in the correct gear to make sure that they know where they should be and how they should be operating their bike, self-awareness of others and their surroundings, and to know a little bit about their equipment. Individual sessions should progress into structured group training activities. 
And then, as I said at the very beginning of this webinar, we'd like at some point to graduate and integrate into local cycling community, not if it's just from a participation standpoint, from a lifelong sports standpoint, or if they can actually get into a, uh, the, the participation mode into a, a competition mode. Um, for me, that's what I like, but I know that's sometimes not possible or it's, it's not practical. Um, but uh, if they're riding a bike, that's, that's what counts. Um, and this is a great resource. This is our, from our friends at, at the Special Olympics. And, and uh, this is something that they put together. And I'll click to this link real quick just to, to show you what's here. But it's a, a fantastic resource that I probably would take me six months to put together. And they've been willing to, uh, to, to let us use this. And it's, it's open to anyone. But I won't click through all of this. But you can see it takes, takes you from the very, very beginning, from warm-up to stretching to cool down, tips for, for riding a riding a three-wheel bicycle, um, all the way through to run, learning to ride, coasting, pedaling, uh, mounting, starting, braking, stopping and dismounting, uh, changing direction drills, uh, hand positions, drinking from a water bottle, shifting gears, climbing hills, everything that you would need to develop a workout plan or a session plan is here. And um, if you click on any one of these links, I believe that there is a description of how to do it. And, oh, this might be a, a bad choice, but there is often a step-by-step -step progression of how to go through this. Um, so it's, it's very detailed. There's, there's video. There's a lot of, you can print it off as a PDF, I believe. So you can, you can create a little manual from it. And uh, it's the best resource that I've found out there um, for, our, uh, for our athletes so, and, and our coaches. So I, I encourage you all to, to look at this link, to look through it, and to develop some, some session plans. And uh, it's as good a resource as you'll find out there. And as far as cycling clubs and coaches, the best network for cycling is to go to usacycling.org. Uh, follow this link. It will go give you all the clubs that are registered with USA Cycling. It breaks it down by state and by city. Um, and there's also a link to coaches. So if you're looking for people and cycling coaches to help out um, your programs, this is a great link. Go to the cycling uh coaches.org, actually USA Cycling.org coaches, and you'll find uh, what site USA Cycling uh, certified coaches are in your area. And I choose, I, I, I actually, I'm not telling you who to choose, but um, you know, you don't have to go to a, a category or level one coach, that's your sort of elite coach. A lot of times these coaches are very good, very well uh, versed in knowledge, um, but they, a lot of these coaches have coaching businesses, they're pressed for time. Um, you know, a level two or a level three coach is more than adequate. Uh, they can help you, and, and not only when, when you work with a coach, um, they bring on a lot of resources that can help you uh, as far as bike shops, equipment, um, training rides, uh, courses and routes for your group. Uh, they, they become very, uh, very much a part of what you're doing and, and a very good resource for you. So I, I strongly I uh, encourage you to explore these links for, for assistance for clubs. Uh, clubs are always associated with bike shops. Bike shops you're going to have to rely on. Um, and coaches will also be valuable at some point, um, just for the local expertise. Um, so that's about all I have. I'm sorry I went so long. Um, but uh, please feel free to, to field questions to Jeff or myself. And uh, I thank you for your time and participation. OK, very good. Craig, that was excellent. Um, you covered so many different topics. Uh, we did go a little bit over, but it was a tremendous information. We do have some questions, and we'll go through them really quickly. We appreciate everyone staying on board uh, to do that, uh, to answer the questions. Um, and you can type in some now if you have, um, if you have questions as we go along. Real quick. Um, how high should the safety flag be? Uh, basically, it should be about head height. 
um, if you're from someone that's standing. So basically, it should be you know, four, to, you know, anywhere from four to six feet high. It needs to be as as basically as high as you can get it because you're trying to notify uh, people that are driving cars uh, that you're uh, that you're on the road. So it needs to be in their line of sight. So the higher the better, especially with big SUVs and and the trucks that are on the road today. Uh, the higher the better. Okay. Uh, another one here. We are starting an adaptive equipment rental program in July. What do you suggest we have in our fleet available for renting, considering that we are catering to a variety of abilities? Um, I would I would recommend that you have um, two to three hand cycles. That you have a an upright. That you have a and a couple of recumbents. Uh, the recumbents are adjustable enough that that um, you should be able to get most people into a recumbent. Uh, I would probably uh, suggest a tandem because a tandem can be used for multiple groups. I mean, everyone, with the exception of the spinal cord injuries, can get on a tandem. Um, I would, you know, bike schools are always good, but. You know, it's not hard to find bicycles, but if you can get a couple of bicycles, that's great. Trikes are hard to find and are costly, but if you have them, they're very good for the, the TBIs and the CPs. So a trike, two to three hand cycles, a tandem, and a couple of bicycles. That would that'd, that'd cover your bases right off the bat. Okay. Uh, we're wondering if there is a source to find out pricing, uh, we provided a lot of information on different bikes, um, and where would be the best place to go to get a general pricing of these types of bikes? I think if you go to the uh, the bike rack, um, the, the the link that I put in there, they they're a good starting point for adaptive equipment. Uh, they have prices there. They're you know they run programs, but they're also a retail retailer. So um, they have a lot of uh, adaptive equipment there, from from bicycles to hand cycles uh, to grips to you know strapping and things like that. So uh, I think that that's a great resource. So click on that link, follow it through, and uh, it's, there should be some good information on that. As a follow up, is there um, do your office play a role in assisting um, elite athletes in choosing the proper equipment? Uh, yeah, we're all, we'll help anyone. You know, if, if there's if there's someone whether they're just starting out in cycling, um, or whether they're you know trying to make the Paralympic Games team, we'll always be here as a resource to to work you know to work with individual athletes or try and answer their questions from an equipment standpoint, uh, from a coaching standpoint, training, um, trying to find them a coach in their area, trying to put them or, or steer them in the direction of a club. Or a, or a community program, um, you know. If I, sh I should have, I should have uh, put my uh, my uh, email address on here, and I apologize for that. But feel free to use me directly as a resource to to uh, answer some of the questions that coaches, individuals, programs may have. Okay, and we will send that email out with our follow up information that we send this afternoon. Um, another question is, um, where can we go to find out um, a schedule for upcoming cycling events? Well, it, it's a pretty, pretty open-ended question. I'll try and answer it. Um, USA Cycling has a, has a link where you can look at events nationally, regionally, um, in your area, within your city, within your region, within your state. Uh, if we're talking th that's not non-specific to athletes with a disability. If you go to um, our website and the link that I provided, there should be um, a uh, an event link, and that should have all the uh, Paralympic events that are going on this year that that we know about. They're not necessarily community events; they're more competitive events that that have a national or international flavor to them. Uh, so, so our website should have that. Um, from a domestic level, I mean, anyone with a USA Cycling license or willing to purchase a one-day license can turn up at any USA Cycling event um, and say, take out a one-day license or go with a license and compete. 
So don't don't think that you're limited just because you have individuals that are in a hand cycle or on a tandem um, or you know on a on a uh, on a tricycle or on a, an adapted bicycle. Um, their USA Cycling should not put a barrier up to compete. Okay. Um, here's a technical question: Are seven-speed internal hubs worth purchasing, or did, or is spending the money on higher-speed cassettes of more value in the long run? I think going with the uh, with the cassette option, even though they may require a little bit more investment initially, will give you a lot more options. Uh, especially if someone's going to be in the sport long term. They tend to be lighter as well. At some point, weight will become an issue, and uh, athletes will be spending copious amounts of money trying to reduce the weight of their equipment. Um, I would go with the you know, 8, 9, 10-speed cassette. Uh, it requires an initial investment, but it gives an athlete a lot more gear selections. Um, and if they do run into uh, equipment issues, it's a lot easier to change out. That's the, it's the, that's the common equipment for bicycles these days. So if someone is at an event and they have a flat tire or they break a spoke or damage a wheel and there are spare wheels available or someone is willing to give them a wheel, um, the compatibility is there. So it's a lot easier to swap out equipment from one bike to another than having something that is unique and no one can, uh, can offer up equipment to, to help you out in a sticky situation. Okay, that looks like it's the, our last question. And if you, um, again, you have uh, a survey coming your way, there's an opportunity to list additional questions there and an open-ended final question on the survey. So please, if something comes to mind, please ask the question and uh, Craig will follow up with it. Um, and uh, we will be sending out handouts to uh, everybody who, who completes the survey. On behalf of Blaze Sports America and the U.S. Paralympics, I really want to thank Craig for being with us today. He did a, a fantastic job, covered a lot of information. We will be doing follow-up webinars on specific topics with cycling in the future, and uh, everybody that get information on this will get uh, information on future webinars. Again, um, thanks to Craig today, and uh, thank you for tuning in.